All right, welcome Obi-Wan. How are you all doing? Good, good. So good to see you. I'm seeing, I want to say special welcome to those in the venue as well. Um, it's great to see so many faces I haven't seen in a long time. And so uh, it's just uh, summer. People are traveling. We're missing some of the people here, but we're also getting to see people who are back to visit us during summer. So what a special time. Uh, great to have you guys here. Hey, I want to share. I asked Christina, uh, who's our Children's and Family Ministry Director, to allow me to share some good news with you guys. Um, but I want to, before I do that, I I want to make sure you don't miss out on the key opportunity of life groups, you guys. You know, there's nothing, um, you know, secretive about a life group. Uh, you can't, you can try to do life alone, but it becomes really hard. Uh, you can try to do life, whether you're, you're doing life, um, you know, without God or with God, you can try to do it alone, but it becomes really difficult. When you gather people together around you with the same vision, with the same purpose and like mind, you encourage each other, you rub off on each other, and iron sharpens iron. And so to do that, we recognize that sometimes if you're new to the community or if you haven't made Christian friends, it could be challenging to find other Christians who want to achieve the same goals and the same vision as you. And so we provide these groups. Not every group is going to be for you, okay? Not every group is going to want you, okay? <laughs> but, but the bottom line is, is that, you know, there's going to be a group that's going to really fit you. There's going to be people that are in your stage of life, where you're at, maybe some similar experiences in the past uh, that you're going to be able to encourage. Sometimes you might be there and it's not necessarily you about getting encouragement, but it's about you encouraging others. And it kind of goes both ways. So if you don't have that community of believers around you, I encourage you, look online, sign up outside, but take the opportunity to get that community. We make them 10 weeks long because we realize that you know, you guys are commitment phobes, and uh, you guys are scared to make commitments. And so, you know, Shane, I'm gonna, saying I'm going to be there every Wednesday night at 7 is scary or whatever night of the week. And so you say, hey, do it for 10 weeks and go as much as you can, and you're going to see a result happen. You're probably going to want to sign up and do them more and more and more, but at least you can do them in seasons. And that's why we call them life groups. Okay, enough about that. Um, I have some great news, and this is something you don't want to miss out on. If you guys remember, um, I think it was about a year ago, uh, time goes by so fast, I'm not quite sure, but we as a church went, sent a couple missionaries, myself and Toby, to um, Germany. And the purpose of the Germany trip was that we realized as a church, part of our vision is to reach thousands and impact millions with the good news and the love of Jesus. Um, but we can't do that. Again, we need community to do that. And we realize that we're going to make a greater impact when we partner with other like-minded churches. And one of the like-minded churches that we have is this church in Germany called Project Hamburg. And, and so we went there to say, are they really like-minded, and how can we partner together with them? It's not us going there to support them or us going there to give to them, but us going there to partner with them and, and to say, how can we together be stronger? You know, combine our income, combine our resources, combine, you, you get the point. And so we went there, and while we were there, we said, what if we helped plant a church together? together. And it just so happened that they were also raising up another church leader to plant a church in Istanbul, in Turkey. Now, you guys might know a lot of what's been going on in Turkey, and specifically in Istanbul, with the terrorist attack that just killed so many. Um, and there's been so many terrorist attacks there in Turkey and in Istanbul that it's been on the news a lot, and it's been really tragic. But the good news is, is that God is also moving in there. While Satan is seeking to kill, steal, and destroy, God is moving in there. And while it's 100%, you know, right now, or 99.9% uh, a Muslim country, they're actually open to the gospel. And, and so they're, they're willing for people to come in and love on them and just in a gentle, loving way, share the love of Jesus with them. And so it's a great opportunity. And then we met this guy, Bill Gay, who is from Turkey, but raised in Germany. And he wants to literally go and plant a church in Istanbul. And so we got super excited about this. This is going to be a, a perfect divine opportunity from God. And so when he said, the first thing we need to do, instead of just me telling you about it, 
is because we're a real relational church, meaning we believe that people are going to support that which they know and understand. And so we said what we need to do is we need to bring Bill Gay here so you guys can know him. You can see him. You can hear his story. And that way in the future, if we say, hey, who wants to go to Istanbul? You know, not all you're going to be scared because, I mean, are going to want to go because you may be scared. But some of you may really have your heartstrings pulled on by the Lord and say, wow, I really want to go and help plant this church. I really want to support him financially. I really want to partner with making this happen. But that's going to be because a relationship will be built. And so here it is. Don't miss out. In two weeks, Bill Gay is going to be here. And so that's awesome. Bill Gay, you guys, is, is, uh, he's a phenomenal guy. I, I've just been getting to know him. Uh, he's a, a super nerd, and uh, he's just, but he loves Jesus. And he, I think he's like a NASA theoretical scientist or something like that. You know, uh, that kind of nerd, just above and beyond, you know, just brain, you know. And uh, he just wants to, exactly, he just wants to uh, serve God with everything that he has given him. So put it on your calendars. You don't want to miss. We're going to have an interview style. Bill Gay's going to share, and we're going to get to hear about his heart. What's going on in Istanbul? What are the challenges and in, in, in the opportunities for us in Istanbul? And how we as a church can come alongside and be part of impacting and reaching thousands and impacting millions. Sound good? Awesome. Okay, so let's get into the Word. Speaking about missing out on things, I've been thinking a lot as I was preparing for this message how easy it is to miss out on great opportunities. I mean, think about it. Um, have you ever been in that situation where you just like, oh my God, I can't believe I missed out on that, and whatever that is. I mean, generally speaking, it can be like we can have it or um, there can be a job opportunity or a financial opportunity. I mean, I remember when uh, uh, certain companies came out and no one knew it and then all of a sudden they blew up and now their stock is worth 100 bucks, you know, and we're like, oh, if I should have bought that at $1 or something, I'd be a gazillionaire now. And he said, I missed out, you know, and surfing, there's a surf, surf every surfer, for those who aren't surfers, hates to hear this word. You should have been here yesterday you know that's literally the worst thing you could tell a surfer because what that means is is that you missed out on a good day of surfing and you just you know it's a bummer and you missed out but it's not just in that think about it we have things in life that can really overwhelm us and really take our full attention and before we know it we can realize that we've missed gone through life and missed out on the most important things. I mean, think about it. There's a lot of things you can do in life, especially here with all the opportunities here. Happy Fourth, by the way. You know, I mean, with do, doing all the blessed opportunities that God has provided us in this great country, there's a lot of things that we can do. <coughs> but some of those things simply because there's not enough time, enough, enough treasure or talent, and some of those things can rob us of the most important things. And before we know it, we can be going through the day, the months, the years. <coughs> Man, sorry. And we can realize, wow, I've missed out. I've missed out on what counts. I know so many people <clears throat> who've woken up after 10, 15, 20 years and they look at their life and they say, what have I done with my life? I've accumulated toys, money, degrees, but have I really made an impact? Have I invested in the right things? And generally, what are the right things, you guys? Let's be honest. People, right? Wouldn't you say that's the right thing? I mean, it, it's, it's, it's when we look upon our lives and say, how has my life impacted others? Those are the right things. I mean, have you heard about all the parents who've looked up and after 18 years, their kids leave and they go, wow, did I take advantage of that opportunity with my kids? 
I mean, I, I provided a house. I was a good parent. I provided for them. We worked and stuff like that. But did I spend the time that I wanted to spend with them? Or how about spouses? Have you seen the time where you get married and then 5, 10, 15, 20 years pass and then sometimes they can be more strangers than when they were when they first met? And you say, what happened? Did we miss out on something? And it seems like sometimes on our relationships, we can often miss the heart of our own relationships to where we, we, we look in the back in the past and say, wow, you know what, I think there's something wrong here. I think I was busy with so many, maybe even good things that I missed out on the important things. And why I share this is because we're here to know Jesus more. Our vision as a church is to grow in a passionate love with Jesus. And I feel sometimes that I myself, I can look at my own walk with God and I could say, wow, you know what? I think I'm starting, to, I, can, I can, oh man, I'm doing a lot of religious things. But have I missed the most important thing? I mean, there's a lot of people who are very religious, but they've missed out on the heart of God. They missed out on the most important things of God. And I want to make sure that doesn't happen to us because it's so easy to fall into a routine. And you guys, I'm no different. I spend my life preaching and teaching about the Word of God. But even someone like that who spends their life can fall into these routines about preaching and teaching about the Word of God. And you can say, before I meant it, wow, I've missed something. And so today I want to look at and ask you guys a simple question. What have you missed? What have you missed? And the truth is, is that we've all missed certain things in our lives with our relationship with God and with each other. And God wants us, and the, here's the good news, God wants us to press the refresh button. I hope today you guys are ready to press a refresh. You know, like on your computer, you refresh the screen. It's the same way with the Lord. Because we can get so many pop-up screens in our lives and get so inundated with different things that bog our lives down, sometimes we need to close some windows and just press refresh. And in our lives with God, it becomes that way. We're constantly being sent spam messages in the world around us and being bombarded with different things. Look at all these cool computer terminologies I'm coming up with here. How about that, dude? Wow. It wasn't even planned. It just popped in there. I love it. You know, and so these cool, you know, these just things are just popping up and we have to really just kind of close them down and press refresh. Otherwise, we're going to look back on our walks with God and maybe have a lot of religious things, but miss out on the true important things. So to do this, I'm going to look at a passage, since we're looking at what Jesus did, I'm going to look at a passage when Jesus went to dinner with the people who hated him most. Have you guys ever been to like a, a party or a dinner where you really didn't want to go? You know, I mean, maybe your spouse dragged you, you know, and, or your boyfriend and girlfriend dragged you, and you're just like, oh, man, this is going to be a nightmare. And you're just like, okay, you owe me, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's just like one of those things, and, <clears throat> and you just kind of like look through those things. Well, Jesus had it even worse than that. Maybe you've been to a party and you ran into someone you really didn't like, you may have even hated, and, and it, those are the most awkward parties, aren't they? I mean, what do you, you just kind of say, hey, how are you doing, you know? Uh, but anyways, it's, uh, it, this is what Jesus was at. So Jesus is at this party with all the first century Pharisees. And if you didn't know, the Pharisees, the pastors of the first century, really hated Jesus because they didn't understand Jesus. They missed the point. But the good thing about Jesus was, being God, he could have fully just destroyed them. But he didn't. Instead, he tried to teach them. And I love it. You know, instead of, you know, destroying the Pharisees for missing the point, he tried to teach them and love them. And it's the same way with us. Even though we've missed the point so often, God wants to teach us how to grab a hold of the truth so that we won't miss out and look back on life living full of regrets. So turn to me to Luke 14, and let's read how Jesus says, what did you miss? And let's refresh in our own hearts. Beginning in verse 1 of Luke 14, we read, it says, One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat at the home of a prominent Pharisee, remember Pharisee, you guys, basically first century pastor, all right? And so he went to a prominent first century pastor. He was being carefully watched. You see, remember, because they were his enemies. And so they were constantly looking to catch Jesus in a trap. 
They were constantly looking to say, Aha, I got you, Jesus. They wanted to catch him in some heresy so that they could crucify him. And eventually, because they could never catch him in heresy, they made up lies to crucify him. And so here they were with Jesus, having him over, not because they liked him, but because they wanted to catch him and entrap him. But Jesus knew this, and he still loved on him. And then he says, There in front of him was a man suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. And in, literally in the Greek it says, and they behold, they put in front of him. So literally he was like a plant. And they were going to see. And the thing they were checking out would be whether or not Jesus would heal him. Because very beginning in Jesus' ministry, he would heal on Saturday, which was the Jewish Sabbath. And the reason why that bothered the Pharisees is because they believed any type of religious work or any work was against God. And they misunderstood this law. And so here is Jesus at this home of their enemies, and they put this man who had abnormal swelling in his body, and they put him in front of him as a test. And they're going to say, will Jesus heal this guy? And look what Jesus does. Jesus asked the Pharisees and the experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? So he knew right away what was going on, but they remained silent. So taking hold of this man, he healed him and sent him on his way. Then he asked him, if one of you has a child or an ox that falls into the well on the Sabbath day, will you not immediately pull him out? And they had nothing to say. Okay, so first of all, they're hypocrites. Because they're they're basically looking to condemn Jesus for healing a sick child of God on this holy day, even though when they would do it their own if a, their own animal or their own child fell into a well, they would help out. But for their looking to crucify Christ because he's looking to heal a human being on this holy day. And so he's calling them out on the hypocrisy. But that's not the real heart of this passage. What is the real heart of this? This little first six verses. He's saying is you missing the heart of God. You see, what you have done is you've begun to relate to God based on following a set of religious rules. And for you, this particular religious rule is not doing a certain type or amount of work on a single day. When the reality is, is God created the Sabbath, but he created the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath is simply a tool that God created. It was a tool that was meant to bless humanity so that they would have a day of rest where they intentionally focused on God. It wasn't meant to be this, you know, this this straitjacket on humanity. In the same way, God gives us commands today. He says, look it, I want you to attend church, not because attending church is meant to define your relationship, but because it's meant to bless you in your relationship. He says, I want you to protect you from committing certain sins, not because you're, what you do or don't do is going to define your relationship, but because I want to protect you. What the Pharisees had done is they diminished God's call upon their lives to following a set of rules, and they missed out on the heart of God. You guys, if I told you that being a parent was defined as just changing poopy diapers, most of you wouldn't want to be a parent. Because if that's what you defined as being a parent, who would want to do that? But when you realize being a parent is about falling in love and raising up a kid you can't love more than anything else, and watching them grow up and learn about life and sharing that life with them. When you realize that, you're willing to change the poopy diapers. The changing the poopy diapers is a result of your love for that kid. It doesn't define your relationship with the kid. The same way with marriage. If I said to you guys, marriage is like taking out the trash and doing chores. You guys, I hate to take out the trash and do chores. Yesterday, my wife made me do a ton of chores. You know, but the truth is, is I don't do those because I like to do them, and my relationship with my wife isn't defined by what I do. It's defined by the love I have for her. If I would define marriage by by taking out trash and doing chores, then not not many of you would want to get married. Maybe you clean freaks out there, you know, but you see... (laughs) 
I do that because I'm scared of her. No, I'm just kidding. I do that because <laughs> I love her and a little scared of her too. But, you know, I do that because I love her and I, I want to bless her. But you see, the action becomes at a response of love to her. And when I fail to do the action, I'm failing to love her. But the action isn't based on, that action isn't marriage. It's the same way with God. You see, the Pharisees had diminished their relationship to God. They missed out on the heart of God because they had diminished their relationship to God by following a bunch of rules. You guys, God gives us rules for our own blessing and our own benefit. They help us receive the blessings of God. I don't tell, I don't tell my little girl, my little, she's like me, she loves to watch TV. I, I don't tell her she can't watch TV because I want to make her life suck. You know, I tell her because I want to protect her from watching garbage. It's because I love her. You know, and sometimes, and I, I want, I can't wait till she gets older. Most of the shows I watch with her, I, I'm watching a show and she'll come in, hey dad, what you watching? <laughs> nothing. <laughs> you know, it, 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 nothing you could watch, you know? I mean, it's just like, I'm like, all right, here we go. She loves to watch a show kicking it, you know? I mean, and it's just like this kid's show, and, and I'm like, great, that's for the 50th time, watch kicking it, you know? And, and you know, and it's, it's just kind of like, I, you know, it, why do I not want her to watch that? Because I don't want her to get that garbage in their head. Why do I watch that garbage? That's another sermon, okay? Uh, that it's, but it's still, the point being, is that I want to protect her because I love her. My relationship with her isn't defined by what I let her watch and not watch. It's defined on love. My love then has a consequence or a response. The Pharisees, the first century religious people, they were responding to God based on rules. But let's be honest. It's easier to have a relationship with God based on rules. My natural default, my natural, my default, you know, when you go back to, my default is to want to go to something based on rules. Why is that? Because it's easier. I can get in grip. It's harder for me to love God, love my wife, love others, love you, than it is just to do a checkbox. You know, if you just say, okay, responsibility, take trash out, you know, preach, uh, read two scriptures or two passages or two chapters or whatever every hour or two hours or every day every week you know if I can attend church once a week up if you're a pastor or real holy twice a week you know I mean if you just you know I mean if we could just check box those things but you say our vision is to grow in a passionate not check box not religious rules but in a love with God and you see and that takes more effort anyone who's married knows that to love someone takes effort it takes a transparency. It takes a commitment. It takes a true desire and total dedication to say, I'm going to give of myself and I'm going to love that person. I'm going to forgive. I'm going to share joys, highs and lows. You know, I'm going to commit to loving that person. That's, that, see, that takes, it's easier just to check off a box. And with God, it's the same way. And you guys, I'm, I'm in this boat just as much as you. And we have to help each other out in this boat. You know, I find myself drifting into that, that same category as a pastor. It's like, oh, okay, I've got to preach. It's another thing I have to do. Oh, I have to, you know what, I have to do this counseling. Another thing I have to do. Oh, I have to get and study and read this book, you know. It's another thing I have to do. It's like, wait a second. You know, I get to do those things, but if I allow those things to become my relationship with God, I'm missing the heart of God. I want to do those things. I'm blessed when I preach. I truly am blessed. I'm blessed when I get to help others. But you know what? If that's going to define me, then I'm missing out. And it gets tiring, doesn't it? It gets exhausting. A lot of you are burnt out on religion because you've reduced your relationship to following rules instead of allowing your relationship to be a relationship rooted in love and let the rules follow out a response to that love. Don't be like the Pharisees who are hypocrites. And we're like that sometimes. But not only hypocrites, but don't be like that who miss the heart of God.
Make sense? All right, so continue, because the dinner conversation isn't over. Somewhere during, later on in the meal, Jesus looks at them, and you got to love Jesus. I just love him. And he says, when he noticed that the guests picked place of honor at the table, he told him this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor, for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. All right, I just imagine here, just think about what's going on in Jesus' head. Here's God in a bod. God in the flesh left heaven, took on the form of a servant. Now he's at his enemy's house, so to speak. He loved these people, although they hated him. And he's sitting there and he's watching them around, and they're all jostling to say, who gets the place of honor, which was right next to the host? Who gets the place of honor? And he's sitting there saying, wow, you guys have no clue who I am. And you are missing the purpose of who you are. And so he continues on, and he says this, he says to them, uh, someone more distinguished you may have been invited. If so, the host will invite both of you and come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then humiliated you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you'll be honored in the presence of all other guests. And here's the key reason why. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Sounds very familiar. Didn't Jesus also say all those who surrender their life will find their life? And all, hold, all those who hold on to their life will lose their life? It's the same principle. You see, they were all jostling. They were all rustling to get the place of prominence, of furthering themselves. And Jesus was like, you guys have really missed the purpose here. And he goes on. After he talked to the guests, he then he turns to the host. And so he has both groups here. He has all the guests, and then he also has the host, the one who's throwing the dinner. And he says to him, he says, Then Jesus said to the host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, and sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed. What? You will be blessed. Why? And although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteousness. So what he was looking around is he was simply saying, look at you host. First of all, you guests were trying to be self-seeking and further your own agenda by where you could get to the host. And you host was also being self-seeking because you're just trying to invite all those other people who can pay you back. You're missing the heart. You should have humbled yourself so God could have exalted you, and you, host, should have invited and served others so that you would have been fully repaid and blessed by God. You guys, this is so much the case with our purpose. So often we miss out on our purpose because we are so bombarded, we are so focused on furthering our own self-interest because there's only so many hours in the day. We're so focused on exalting our own self that we miss out on the true blessings of God. You, each of you have been born again if you're a believer in Jesus. If you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, if you said, Lord, I believe you died for my sin and that I'm now to live for you, you've been born again. But that new life has a new call on it. Just as 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, you're a new creation in Christ. With that new creation comes a new purpose. And here were God's people, the religious people, yet they forgot their purpose. They were missing out on their purpose. And what was the consequence? The consequence was, is they were missing out on the blessings of God. Instead, they were, they were fighting jostling around for places of honor places of honor where for here on this earth you guys when you seek to further yourself here above yourself in god's kingdom you're gonna miss out when you seek to sit there and put yourself first before others and god you're gonna miss out and god says don't miss the point we're here on a mission trip this life is a mission trip this life is not about build your best kingdom here. If it was, then that should be your goal. If this life was it, then you should seek to be the wealthiest, the richest, the best person, whatever on earth I suppose it is, if this was it. But this is not it. This is a prelude to the big party. 
And he says, your job is to be servants. Your job is to put others' needs first. Your job is to be self-sacrificing so others can see the love of God. I've called you so that you can be my light. Don't miss out on that. But more importantly, don't miss out on the blessings that come with that. Isn't that weird? In God's economy, when we lay down our rights, He exalts us. When we try to pick up our rights, He humbles us. See, God wants to be the one that raises you up. But you have to humble yourself before God in order for Him to raise you up. If you try to exalt yourself, He will humble you. If you try to further your own interests, you're going to miss out on God's interests. But it gets up. Like a heated soap opera, it only gets better. Have you guys ever been in one of those... Um, Jesus, by the way, you guys did catch that Jesus was rebuking them, right? All right, he was chastising them for their selfish attitude. Have you ever been in one of those arguments where you've, you've trying, to, trying to argue your point and you're chastising somebody and, or you're chastising your group and then someone in the group says, yeah, that's right, teach them, tell them. And you're like, dude, you're part of it. You know, I mean, you're part of the problem. Well, that's kind of what happens here next. Look at what it says in verse uh, 15. It says, when one of those at the table heard, heard this, he said to Jesus, yeah, blessed is the one who will eat the feast of the kingdom of God. Why did he say that? Because Jesus just got finished saying, you know what, hey, if you surrender yourself, if you recall, if you put and don't miss your call, miss your purpose here, then you're going to receive blessings in the kingdom of God. And then this guy steps up from the dinner table and says, oh yeah, blessed are those who are at the kingdom and the feast of the kingdom of God. And she says, all right, wait, wait, wait one second. You're missing the point still. Look what he says. A certain man, he tells him this, another parable. He says, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At that time, the, bank, the banquet, he sent a servant to tell them who had been invited, come for everything is now ready. Okay, real quick. Notice there's how many invitations? Two. First, he says, I'm going to have a banquet. Okay? They say they're going to come. It's like you get those little Evites, and you, you know, I, I'm always careful. I don't say yes to those. And, and you're always, I'm the one that you always says, is he coming or not? You know, because I, I don't want to say yes to those and then not show up. You know, but those are the Evites you get. And then if you say yes and you don't show up, then you really look bad. And so he just says, yes, these people said yes. But then when the time of the banquet comes, they gave him all these excuses. And in verse 18, they all like began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. And the servant came back and reported this to his master. Now, what are they basically telling Jesus? They're telling him, I have better things to do. And you see, what they're missing out and one of the greatest things that we miss out on is the value and the blessings of God's kingdom. You see, that's putting God's needs first and seeking out God. I've said this so many times, and I can't help it because it's all over Scripture. But seeking and living out for God is not a demotion, but a promotion. But you see, they considered it a demotion. Checking out their land, which was probably an excuse anyways, because they, you don't buy land without checking it out already. So basically what they were saying is, I don't really feel like coming to your party. I don't really feel like seeing you, Jesus. Buying five oxen, well, I don't buy oxen, but we buy cars and toys and stuff. And basically they're saying, hey, I'm going to go play with my stuff before I serve you, God. Oh, I'm going to have another party I have to go to. What I have to offer is of greater value. What they're missing out is the value of God. You guys, if God has been diminished in your hearts as just a value for when you die or to pick you up as an antidepressant, then you're really missing the blessings of God. You really are. If we've put God in this little box where he's fire insurance or get out of jail card free or 
you know what, hey, when I'm feeling bad, I'm going to go spend my hour and a half, and the pastor's going to pump me up and make me feel really good, and then, or I'm going to absolve my sin every Sunday, and then I'm going to come back and then basically go live the rest of my life the way I want. You're missing out. You're missing out. And then you're going to wake up one day and say, wow, I sure went to that party. I bought that land. I bought that oxen. I did all that stuff, you know, and I, I, I spent all my time and money and all of those things. But I missed out when you stand before Jesus on the most important things, his kingdom. There's an old saying that if you had a real, real, real long line this life is like a minuscule of it. An eternity with God is what values. We tend to spend all our energy focusing on this little, little bit and forget all this life that we'll live with God in kingdom, in his kingdom. If we learn it to able to keep our eyes on the prize. This is why Jesus says in Hebrews 12, 1, he says, throw off everything that hinders you and the sin that so easily entangles you. You guys, we keep we have to challenge and encourage each other. Because I'm so easily defaulted to things of this world of greater value than God. Isn't that true? You're gonna leave this this doors here in less than ten minutes. Oh, okay, it'll be more than ten minutes. I'm gonna talk a long time. Okay. You're gonna leave here in about 30 minutes. No, not that long, you know, but you're going to leave here and then you're immediately you're going to go, oh, okay, relax. I know you're starting to panic, you know, but you're going to leave here and then you're automatically going to start to think, oh, okay, I got to go do this, do this, do this and that. And the, the challenge is to say, oh, okay, wait a second. Have I allowed God to stay in the forefront of my heart, of my mind, of all that I do? And that's what he wants us to do. The Pharisees were religious right? They were the pastors. They were me. They, they were me, but they lost the main point. They forgot the heart. They forgot the purpose, and they forgot the blessings of God. I do that. Truly, I do. I look at the wicked or the, and envy the wicked. I look at those, and I'll get house envy, money envy, party time envy, because it looks like you watch television, you watch all these things, it looks like they're having all the best fun, right? You're like, wait a second, that's a lie. I'm amazed. This is why we need a refresh. Fall back to our first love. I'm amazed how easily I forget of the mud that I crawled, that God pulled me out of. And then I sometimes look back and say, oh man, I should have ate more poo when I was younger. I'm just like, really? When I was in it, it wasn't so cool. But now you look back and you forget, and you're like, oh, man. And you just want to go back to that. And it's like, like a dog returning to his vomit. It, it's, it, we're crazy. We are crazy. But let's encourage each other, you guys. Press refresh button. You know, um, it really takes some time. And daily ask yourself, what am I missing? Don't be so busy where you fill up your eyes and, and your, your heart and your time. Go, 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 go. There's something good about pausing and saying, what am I missing? Am I missing the heart of God? Am I missing my call, my purpose? And am I missing out on the blessings of God? You know, this is what God wants in our lives. He wants us to really experience his living life. Today we're going to celebrate communion, and I thought what a great way, I mean, since we're talking about dinner with Jesus, I figured we could share a meal with Jesus. And you know, communion is just like that. Communion is, is a meal with Jesus. And when he first did communion with his disciples, it was during the Last Supper. And when he did it, he made it a, a contract with him, and he talked about the main things. He says, I want you to look to me for your sustenance. And so I give you this bread, symbolic of my body. This bread is my body. When you eat this, you're eating of my body. And what was that purpose? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
me, I'm the one that's going to provide for you. Not just physically, but spiritually as well. You cannot do it on your own. And then later on, during the meal, he took a glass of wine and he says, this is now my blood. And I'm going to pay for your sins by your blood. And so when we eat and drink of this communion, we're making a new compact, a new pact, a new covenant, a new agreement, a new refresh. That's why he says do this, because we're forgetful people. And so we have to remind ourselves, what is the main thing that I'm missing? Am I trying to live life on my own strength, or am I depending on God's? Am I living life on my own righteousness or am I leaning in on Christ? Am I missing out on my call, the blessings, and the heart of God? If so, press refresh. Make sense? That's it. I love the fact that Jesus didn't just deny their invitation to their heart. What I mean to say is, I think if I was asked to go to a dinner with my enemy, I would, I would come up with a thousand excuses and reasons why not to go. But Jesus didn't. In the same way, I think how cool it is if we ask Jesus to dinner within our hearts, he's going to come and reveal our hearts to us. It says in Psalm 139, search me and know me and test things within my hearts. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to ask God to search you and know you and test the things of your heart? If you are, he'll show you. It's all about God. He'll show you. Holy Spirit will teach you. So I'm going to ask uh, the worship team to come on out, and they're going to, they're going to lead us in a, in a time of response. And as they lead us in that time of response, the ushers will come forward.